Okay, once again, my friend Roger from Mud Fossil University, home of the Shocker Du Jour. And again, I am going to shock you another time today. Now, what are we talking about? In the last couple, well, the last video actually was about geology rocks. All right, now this guy has been after me for 10 years. He's a commercial guy and he's, he's a geologist and he claims to fully understand about the earth and these layers and why these layers are de depositional, in other words, sedimentary rather than biological, which I claim. Now, my claim is that he won't pay any attention to the evidence I've sent him. Just as he said right now, I didn't watch your video, but I saw the first 30 seconds and I realized it's just ridiculous. So, this is the kind of stuff you get from people that won't pay any attention to the reality of things. Now, he is supposedly does business in Earth. He, he has to decide exactly where to drill and how when the fossil record is showing what to stop drilling and all this stuff. Yes, I understand that. And I'll show you. I know what he's drilling through. And I can show you what he's drilling through. And if he shows me the particulates that he's looking for, I will be able to identify them. All right, that's my claim. I'll be able to identify the particulates that he's looking for. And they will be fascia and pleura. I literally wrote the book on this. <laughs> this is just crazy. I literally wrote the book on this. You know, I have to admit, he's, he seems like he's trying to be nice, but he's just not paying any attention. It's very frustrating when somebody just says, I know all this stuff and you have to watch everything I present, I, which I know all the stuff he's presenting. I understand exactly what he's saying, but he won't pay any attention to what I'm saying. I'm just going to cut the, right down here. It says, I have not yet seen all your video, but I know enough to completely miss the entire point I was making. No, I didn't, Paul. I know exactly the point you're making, and I showed it exactly in my video, and I will explain it again now for you in very brief, simple statements. All right, so let's see what Paul's claim is. He's saying, inside what I call is skin, we found thousands of marine fossils. Well, thousands of marine fossils. And those marine fossils always occur in the same order, in depth. This one, then the next one, and then this one, and that one, always the same way. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. He thinks it's because the same layers were left over all the entire world in the same layers. Doesn't make any sense. Unless there was global floods everywhere in the whole world every six months or something. What I will show you is these are biology. And that's why the different, he's talking about sea creatures. They have no idea what's a sea creature and what's a land creature. Because when this whole global flood happened, which was not that long ago, the entire world was a sea. So these things, he says, would, how can you find sea creatures within your body parts? Well, it's because the body parts were invaded by the sea. They were preserved by the sea. So plankton and little tiny, tiny little microbes, yes, they were everywhere. So obviously they're going to be infused into things. But a lot of the things they thought were sea creatures aren't even sea creatures. They're, they're part of the body of the creature. And they were like filter devices, like clams and things like that. Th those kind of things were inside of creatures doing filtering the blood and filtering the f lymph and all that. These creatures were so big, the clams, you wouldn't even ever know. You could have 10,000 billion of them in you and you wouldn't even know they were there. That's the size of the creatures I'm talking about. Now, he won't pay attention to the reality, but I'm going to show you and I will show you what he's drilling through. And if he shows me, all I got to do is see the pictures of what he's taken and, and saying this is this layer and this is this layer and this is I could I'll be I'd be able to tell you what it is what the chemistry is and I will also have the same stuff here that I can demonstrate and I'll start right now all right the layers Paul is drilling through is fascia 
And fascia is instrumental in perfectly preserved fossilization in wet, fine, continuously wet mud, which is like underground, under the ocean, so forth. The product can be exact copies of the living creature's flesh colors and all, including the layers of fascia, which will be exactly the same every single time if it's over a certain type of organ, and a certain type of organ is going to cre create a lot of hydrocarbons, and primarily they're going to be hearts and lungs. Now, this is in 2015. I wrote this paper, and nobody knew about it. Nobody was even paying attention to fascia. They didn't have any idea about it in the medical industry. So this is 2015. It wasn't even recognized until 20, 20, uh, 2018. And then they say it's the biggest organ in the human body. It's fascia. It coats every organ like this lung. That's a lung from a human being. It's been DNA tested, CAT scanned. It's anatomically exact. It's flat as a pancake because it was in the flood. Now, all the things that Paul is drilling through, he's as soon as he hits this fascia, he realizes the next thing he's going to hit is a bucket full of blood that has been converted because of pressure and decomposition under the ocean floors in or wherever it was. And as long as it's deep down and it's oxygen free, it will create hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons is what he's pumping out of the ground. So yeah, I'm a hand screamer. Call me a hand screamer, hand wafer, whatever you want. But this is what he's drilling through. I wrote the book on it. All right, this is the lung. And I got it in the microscope. We're gonna be looking at it in a second. I got another lung here, which has parts of the pleura is eroded away, and we're down into the alveoli under there. That's what they want to drill into to hit for the blood for. Well, the blood turns into hydrocarbons, and, and it just pressurizes like crazy. The more it pressurizes, the more it, it turns into more hydrocarbons. That's the degradation process of blood, literally, for fluids in the body. And lungs and hearts and, and livers contain the most. Now, they're going to have this heavy-duty pleura on the outside. That's what he hits, and he says, ooh, look at that stuff. That means we're going to hit you know, oil, and that's quite likely true. All right, here's it right here. Fascia was thought to be mere packing material, just in there like fluff, this fuzzy little stuff. They called it fuzz, and it was vis virtually inert. It has long been ignored as a subject of research until I saw it in the mud fossils. Recently, however, it has been new equipment that allows a viewing of the fascia as it does its job, which is fascinating. Once again, many experiments, there was totally unexpected results. Now, fascia is a fluid-filled fabric network. It coats everything in your body, instantly reconfigures itself if it's damaged or pulled apart. These little tiny tubes are just everywhere. So you can break some here and there, it won't matter. Now, it appears, uh, anyway, I went on to explain the whole thing and how, you know, how I worked with people over in Germany and so forth. The only people that were interested were some people in Germany and one guy here in the United States who did, did a video called The Fuzz, and this was the fashion. And I got a hold of them and we talked it over for a couple of years. I showed a bunch of my stuff and he never c confirmed anything about my research, but he did end up putting something out reconsidering the fuzz, which means it's, it's not just there for nothing. And now they realize, and then, then there was a paper written about it in 2018, that it is the biggest organ in the human body. It's interstitium, and this is where our immune system is. And this is what he's drilling through is an immune system. I'm not kidding. You. Okay, so Paul wants me to respond to why these layers continuously are seen layer after layer. This, I would suspect, is one of the earliest parts that he sees as they're entering into a lung, all right? And this is pleura, all right? And it's in this lung I have right here. It's in the microscope. Now, uh, I am going to put a little water on it. It makes it get nice and, and bright looking. But all of those little white fibers 
are so that the lung can expand and contract. It's, and it's a very goopy substance. I'll show you what the sta the story of it is medically. But at this very corner down here, they all have a place at the very corner where the lung locks into the rest of the body. It's a, I call it the spurlock. That's not even known either. I'm not kidding you. It's not known. I put water on there, turn the blood just like that. Rehydrate in an instant. Now, once you get into the lung area, you get into that that pleura. The pleura is the rubbery substance that coats the lung. And again, this is that lung. And it's been DNA tested, CAT scans, a human lung. There's no question whatsoever about it. Now, the things that Paul is seeing is this stuff, or he may also see something like this. Hold on, whoops. The two mouses going on at the same time. Something like that. Same thing. This is the He's talking about microfossils. These are, you call them whatever you want. These are straps that are in grip skin. Now he'll be seeing stuff like this. That's got gold in it. Let me see what else we got here. Primarily he's going to be seeing this. When he sees this, they better stop drilling. Because the next thing through that is through the membrane into the lung. We're gonna sh I'm going to show you this, but let me put a little water on it. It makes it really vibrant. All right, this is the pleura in a dry area, but these are all the fibers, and the black is, is vein blood, and as we come down here, I put a little moisture into it, and it sort of soaks in, and at the very tip is where all the blood is. This is the investment that locks it into the next body part. And it's this little round tab here. This, they all have a, 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 I call it the spur lock. And right in here, it locks into the next body part. You want to see something? Watch this. This is literally just ripped off. And it's still got blood. The other is still, is well coated. You see back in here? That's pretty well coated with fabric. But right there is where it ripped off of the other part of the body part. Watch this. It's just totally blood. You see that? The whole thing turned into blood in like almost an instant. I'm just barely scrubbing it. You see that? Now, the point being is that inside this lung, hold on a second. Okay, I, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. I want to apologize again for being, you know, feeling assaulted and responding, you know, kind of harshly. Because Paul has given me the opportunity to go against what he claims to be his evidence. Here is my evidence. He's drilling through to hit the blood supply, basically, which has turned into hydrocarbons. Now, what is he drilling through? He's drilling through the pleura. Now, what is the pleura? Right here, look here. This is what the lung is. This whole outside layer, you see layer, 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 and boom into the lung and that's the pleura and the fascia so I know what he's hitting and he's I'm sure I'm almost positive he's going to be seeing these types of particulates that are going to be coming up with the drill as it hits it and he said whoa, whoa, whoa stop drilling because if you go any further it's going to go through and hit this now this would have normally been just one big literally one ball of blood which is the, the inside of the lung. The outside is normally coated with pleura. In this case, every bit of the pleura went away and was replaced by silicon. But a lot of the blood was still left in here and it just sort of oozed out when I took it. I picked it up and here, it, it, what happened was this little balls of blood came out and here's what they look like. And it was just little balls of blood. They were wet. I guess smear them. And I did. <laughs> so th this is the pleura, which is that stuff on the outside. This lung had none of that stuff. It was only the stuff on the inside here.
Now I have one here that has both of the stuff. This one has the Plura, which is this really heavy duty jobber. It coats the whole lung, supposedly. Now it's pushed away and ripped, and that's what this is. This part here is this part. All right, and all these little tiny things are alveoli. I mean, they are tiny. You got to see them in a microscope. You can, even in a microscope, you have a hard time seeing them. They are tiny little filters for the air. I thought they were big. I thought they were like this. Because here's one that has completely eroded. Originally, I thought these were the alveoli and the air went in there and everything was fine. But no, these are the collectors for the alveoli. And the alveoli are so tiny. These, these right here are the collectors. All right? And then the collectors dump into the big ones. But the alveoli themselves are just as small as can possibly be there. And they're, they're filters for air. They're filters. Now, since this, this paper that I wrote in 2015, I've discovered much more about the fascia and about the interstitch and about the, the locking together of these little flaps, which I call the spur locks. Every organ has one that attaches it to the next piece of meat that it has to attach into or the next organ. And, and it's a, a totally different piece than fascia. And I'll be... I already made some videos on that, but this is unknown to science as well, as was the interstitial. But this goes back, you know, I was saying back here, um, it appears fascia may be much more than simple fuzz, as the doctors refer, referred to it back then. Werner Klinger, University of Ulm, has done some excellent research on fascia. Water has recently shown memory. In other words, you know where it comes from because of, of the structure of the water. And I also feel quantum numbers possibly from folded proteins are the source of the program code. But anyway, I so said that pure part is pure speculation. Anyway, the fascia is this fluid-filled network, totally unknown. And the reason I got some, and I had another person over in um, Germany who runs a fascia institute, I believe, and um, they noticed that the tattoo residues were showing up in other parts of the body rather than where they were, you tattoo up here, and all of a sudden it shows up in your liver or your kidney or somewhere. And that's when we realized there was a fluid-filled highway in that. That goes back prior to this. But it was just interactions between me and a couple other people about fashion. Nobody else cared about it. They didn't even think, they, they just didn't want to talk about it. So anyway, it, it came down to be that it's the newest, most important organ in your body. See, this, this is just being recognized now, and it's not even fully recognized. The first paper this uh, Dr. Thies did was in 2018, saying the interstitium could be a new organ. And it is this fluid-filled highway, the fluid-filled cavities that I talked about in my paper from 2015 now. So this goes back almost 10 years. And it's a, maybe it's a new human organ. And then it's an interstitial fractal-like structure found throughout the body, everywhere, within and between organs and tissues is supported by connective tissue, yes. Thesis discovery was made possible by a new imaging technique that allowed scientists to examine live human tissue. That was back in 2015 that that happened now. Um, previous methods only looked at dead tissue, which is flat, and it had already lost all the all the fluids. My stuff, I could see all the fluids because when they died, they stayed just like they were when they were alive. So I could see that, but when they were doing autopsies, and I know the pe people that were doing the autopsies and reporting, reporting on these body layers, they never saw it. And I talked to them about that. I said, mine has these layers, and then when they started looking into it, they said, wow, this is something new. And that goes back, like I say, back maybe few years earlier than 2015, we started looking deep into the fascia, so, which is into interstitium. The interstitium has, I got to explain it to you. Let me explain it to you because there's a several different layers, and those are the layers that he's drilling through to get to the oil, which is the oil is from hydrocarbons, which are from decaying blood and body tissues, primarily blood. All right, so anyway, 2022, 
the interstitium has been described as a shock absorber. That's what I was told when I first started reporting it to these people. They said it's just fuzz. It's just a, like a bumper pad. And it protecting tissues in areas expanding, contracts, excess skin, lungs, aorta, digestive tract, bladder. It's everywhere in your whole body, so that doesn't make any sense. It may also be a body-wide communication system. It's exactly what I said in my paper, was it could be a um, fiber optic network through the body <laughs> and the source of lymph. Yes, it is lymph. The fluid that immune cells need to function. Yes, this is exactly correct. Now, I, I you know, I'm, these are other things I've been putting out for years. So, if the medical community accepts the interstitium as an organ, it could be the largest organ in the body, making up an estimated 20% of the whole body. The discovery of interstitium may, has been controversial. Scientists continue to debate its implications. Some wonder if the interstitium could be altered or play a role in disease. It is. It's. It's your immune system. Now, I should be part of this discussion. I know they're watching what I'm doing. It's every word of this is a, basically what I said. And Neil's paper, I don't, I don't want to discount him because he's in the profession, and they need, you know, he tried to publish this thing about five times. Nobody would look, would publish it. Finally, had somebody publish about the interstitium as a newfound organ. Well, here, let's see. Network of connective tissues, fluid-filled compartments called interstitium. Um, Let's see. It's everywhere in your whole body. Scientists in a study published Tuesday. This was back in uh, 2018. That's when it was first published about. And that's Neil Tice. And um, this is the interstitium. I've been showing it forever. So, and it is. It's focusing on immune system. That's what we need to do. Treatments for cancer. And everything. Th that is the immune system is where that interstitium lives. That is your immune system, all right? And that's what the same area that Paul is drilling through to get to the buckets of blood. Now, he could be going through cardiac interstitium, cardiac pleura, or he could be going through lung pleura, or he could be going through liver pleura. They will all be different because they have a different chemistry with inside of them. Actually, the blood and the lung may be almost identical. I mean, the um, heart and the lung might be almost identical because they just keep doing the exact same thing all day long. And, you know, they're coated by the, possibly the exact same stuff. And you need a good bacteria and good enzymes in there to protect you. Now, the liver is going to be different. Liver is a toxic environment, I think. So you're going to have to have something surrounding it that is going to deal with that toxicity. Same thing with your gallbladder and your kidneys and all of the different organs in your body. The ones that secrete enzymes are the ones that are going to have to have some special coatings on them. Because you don't want those enzymes just, well, I don't know. I would have to look at all of those different tissues. But I can tell you what, if, if, um, if Paul sends me the tissue samples, all I need to do is see the pictures. And I can tell what layer of the body he's in, basically, because it's going to be one of these layers. Now, this goes back 15 years ago. I was trying to recreate the mud fossils. This is a piece of chicken. I put it in sandy, salty, muddy water for, you know, underneath and I put electrical charge through it. I, it was just like a, a volt and a half battery so that there was some extra electricity hopefully doing something in it. And this is what happened. After, oh, I don't know, maybe three months, six months, I can't remember. But you see all of these little crystals here? That's what will happen. Then this particular spot here became more crystallized than other spots. Whether there was blood here more than likely is the case and the, the the blood turned into the crystallized bits partially probably because of the electrical and in the original thought I had was telluric currents 
which are they're everywhere. Tell your occurrence means the light that hits the earth, it comes in as, a, as electrical particles and it creates a current into the earth. Tell your occurrence. And they will come through the earth, through whatever's in the earth. And so I, that's what I was thinking. That's how it may be a form. Well, I realized after that it had to do with the impact of Venus and a hot water flood. And then the, all the ramifications of that and the silicates that rose up from the ocean floor. If you look it up, well, let's look it up. All right, a couple more things from my paper back in 2015. And remember, the, in 2022, um, Dr. Tice put out that he thought it was a fiber optic network. And I say, this is when, from my paper here, that it appears as if a fiber optic wired network redirecting the broken fibers. I believe fascia is the fiber optic style network in creatures as it connects to every cell and is a complete system. I feel logically the wiring for send and receive communications. It appears fascia may be much more than simple fuzz. That was just, spec you know, that part is pure speculation. Now, the other thing that I said was about the silicon and salacious ooze, which we're going to get into a second. Skin has 50 times the silicon as other tissues. That's why I created the salacious ooze. Every time your skin sheds like you wouldn't believe how much skin you shed a day. And all of that stuff is so tough. It's just, it's silicon, this salacious ooze is tough as hell. And it remains literally forever. And eventually it washes in. And it's very, very heavy. It's very heavy. And it sinks to the bottom of the oceans and becomes this ooze. When we almost got hit by Venus, all that ooze came up to the surface and what's called super saturation of silicon. And this is what Yale said, silicon, well, here it is right here. Exceptional preservation, exceptional preservation, soft body creatures promoted by silica rich oceans. Exactly what I said. Now this goes to 2016. I submitted all this stuff to Derek Briggs. He poo pooed it, but then they wrote this paper on it. All right, this is something I really need to look into because I don't have a whole lot of understanding, although I do know your skin is saturated with silicon, silica, and these little silica parts of your skin are anchors, and those anchors are just tiny, but they drift to the bottom of the ocean because they're extremely heavy, and those are the anchors that hold your skin together. And, and those are the things that are heavy and they don't erode easily. So they end up going into the ocean. That's why your skin is 50 times more silica than everything else because it has to move and, and do all that kind of stuff. And it be anchored. Basically, they, they, those are the anchors. Think of it that way. Basically, in mud fossil terms, that's a tendon ball. <laughs> that is one of the little anchors in the skin. And I believe these are skin cells. Now, salacious ooze is a type of bio, which means biological, ge genic, pelagic sediment. It's just little bits and pieces that all collect. I agree with that. It's located on a deep ocean floor. Yes, because they're going to sink. They're heavy. Salacious ooze are the best common of are the least common of the deep sea sediments and make up approximately 15 percent of the ocean floor they sink deep because they are heavy 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 oozes are defined as sediments which contain at least 30 percent skeletal remains of pelagic microorganisms these are the skeletal remains well yes they are that is literally the skin. These are these diatoms. You see this? I'm telling you, this is pure silica. And this is heavy as hell. I mean, when you pick this up, you can't believe how heavy it is. It's, it's like, like lead or something. Now, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. Silica is roughly 2.5 grams per centimeter. Now, what does that mean? It's two and a half times heavier than water. So if, if this was a pound of water, this thing would have been 2.5 pounds of water because it's silica, but in the same container. It's heavy, and that's why it sinks 
to the ocean floors and becomes the, the, the ooze. Now, unfortunately, this is where Paul's getting his information from, is these scientist peer-reviewed things. And their study, prehistoric ooze, to learn about changes in the ocean over time. Well, we'll talk about that. The sediment distribution deposition patterns of the oozes inform scientists about prehistoric areas of the oceans that exhibited prime conditions for the growth of salacious oozes. They just sort of flittering around trying to figure things out. Now, the problem is, they use these oozes as a tool that they can better infer the conditions of the, of the oceans and the dates and the times and the circulations and all this stuff. It was dead creatures were shedding their skin, basically. And probably there's going to be areas that there was a lot more skin shed because the thing was a lot bigger. All right, and that creates the salacious ooze because that's what was in the skin. And those are the anchors that are in the skin, which I just showed you. All right, the salacious ooze. All right, these are the anchors that are in skin. Right now, they're just saturated throughout your body, too. And back then, they had them, and they were much bigger, and they got all different sizes, and they are heavy, right to the bottom of the ocean. All right, so Paul is a geologist. The rocks are geology. I'm sure he's interested in all this stuff. Now, I am also a geologist, but I do biology and all the rest. Now, pleura and fascia are both tissues in the body that have different functions and locations. Pleura sits on top of fascia. Now, listen to this now. Pleura is a thin, watery membrane that lines the chest cavity and surrounds the lungs. It's part of the respiratory system and helps the lungs expand and contract while breathing. All right, so, and this is a lung, and this is the pleura. Now, they say it is in, it lines the chest cavity, so the chest inside has that lining, and then it also surrounds the lungs. This is the surrounding of the lungs. Now, the pleura produces a lubricating fluid that allows the parietal and visceral pleura to slide against each other without any friction almost. And I'm going to show you something. Where do you see this? This is about the coefficient of friction. You see this? You see it without friction. Listen to this. Synovial joints in humans, which is basically the same thing as synovial fluids, is four times slipperier than Teflon on Teflon. <laughs> so there's just no friction. That's, but you need the, all the enzymes, you need the bacteria to create the enzymes to create all of these products. These are products in your body. And if they're not there, you're not going to have that. You're going to be oh, stiff and, you know, and I... There should be some way that we have a bacterial database that everybody knows what bacteria they have, and then they can make a decision if they're low on something or have too much of something. Because that is your chemistry, because it makes the enzymes. The enzymes are the catalyst. The catalyst do everything in your body. Without the catalyst, it doesn't happen. So anyway, the fascia is a thin layer of loose connective tissue, which is below the pleura separates the coastal pleura from the thoracic wall, which is, in this case, the lung. The separation is useful during surgery because it makes it easier. They've got, they got layers, and they're going to be in the same layer each time, as Paul says. I agree. Now, that's the pleura. Now, the fascia is a tissue found throughout the body, everywhere, 100%. Separates and closes organs, muscles, nerves, everything. And it surrounds them to protect them. It also attaches the skin to other tissues. That's where you have those little balls. It attaches the skin to other tissues so that they can move around, but they always come back. The fascia helps stabilize the body, provides strength, allows muscles, joints, and organs to slide against each other and come back to where they're supposed to be without friction or tearing.
That is, it's a fluid-filled, slippery sloop, and they call it sl um, slurpees. Small, leucine-rich proteins are supposed to be in there. So everything sort of just jellies around. But it's tough, too. Now, it also separates muscles, can help relieve muscle tension. Fascia is elastic and can return to its original shape and size after being deformed by pressure or force. That's why you always come back. Think of a guy playing football and getting smashed and crashed and all that stuff, and then standing up and just walking away from it. Well, that's because all of these things are, there's a lot of anchors too. This is not the thing, they're not taking into account the anchors. They all have an anchor on the corner of the lung. And I found it in all, every single lung. And this one, they also have a, a thing at the top that anchors them in so that they don't go flying around in your body. They can bounce around, but they come back. And even, well, hold on, I'll show you. All right, check this out. This is some kind of muscle, or I don't know what exactly, but this is the spurlock, the uh, latch that latches whatever this is into wherever it's going to. And it looks to me like it's a tendon. And then that tendon will blossom out into a muscle. However, it's got to be latched in, and that is the latch. Same as this latch on this rock. That, that's this rock right here. All right, and this is where that anchor is, right here. Let me blow this up and I'll show it to you. You see that? That's this point right here. Coming down. That right there is where it anchors in to this muscle. You can't see it well in this picture. But as this comes up over the top right here, it's all locked in tight, tight, tight. I mean, it's gnarly. And that's what keeps this body part, whatever it was, a shoulder or whatever, from being ripped away, which this one did. This one ripped away. That's what happened here. It ripped away. It's like this thing here was like that. And the guy went, <laughs> and it pulled away from there. Too much. Now, this one's completely missing from wherever it was attached to. But they all have these attachments, and the lungs have them too. Every single lung has them, and every body part has one. And in between these body parts, the interstitial fluid, which is what I was talking about in my paper, that fluid-filled highway, has to move from this organ into the next one. So there's, I found these little tiny holes in the, in the, in the tip here where it attaches. And they, they have to be pumping that fluid into the next organ which is your, your lymph system, basically, which is in that paper they talked about. The, the lymph system basically runs through this newfound highway. So that's my evidence to show the spurlock is completely different than the rest of them. It's very, very obvious if you look at it deeply, and nobody has, and, and I've been reporting on this, that particular thing for a number of years now, and that hasn't had any interest either. Somebody will pick up on it, though. I know that'll happen. Okay, this is not correct, but it's very useful. Now, a simple explanation of how opals are formed is opal is formed from a solution of silicon dioxide, that's silicates, and water. As the water runs down through the earth, it picks up silica from sandstone and carries this silica-rich solution into cracks and voids caused by natural faults or decomposing fossils. As the water evaporates, it leaves behind silica deposits. This cycle repeats over very long periods of time and eventually opal is formed. I right, visualize the inside of an opal like a bag of marbles. The marbles are the silica spheres, and I can show you all this stuff. Smaller spheres are more commonly forming and tend to diffract the purple-blue-green colors. Well, that's not true. Larger spheres are rarer forming and tend to show off the yellow, pink, red colors, hence why these are the rarer colors to find in Australian opal. Well, Australian opal, let me show you a yoa nut from Australia and what opals are really made from and how they form. 
Okay, you can see this. This is a heart, and it's cut straight across. Now, every bit of these tissue layers have a different chemistry to them. The heart strings will be different than the ventricle walls and so forth. Now, let's see a heart that turned into an opal. All right, now, this was a heart at one time. This was pumping blood. Now, what are we seeing here? We're seeing the same structure, the, the walls of the heart and all these little heart strings coming down and all of the blood in the center which has all of the transition metals, all these different colors. Transition metals are what our body runs on. The transition metals are in the blood, that's why it's so saturated with them. Now, it, it just turned into an opal because the silicates kept building and building and building and they needed to become stabilized and there was a ton of blood here. It was just saturated with blood. So they bonded with their most favorite partner to become stable. This is, this is tissue becoming stable. Means it wants to associate itself to something that has the complement that it needs to become neutral. And with the silicates, they can bond with all kinds of things. So they they do, because they, they normally are given and taken from all of these different tissues. They're friends already. All right, because they come through with your blood. Here's what the transition metals are. All right, and they are in aqueous solutions. You see this? Aqueous. These are metal ions in watery solutions in your body. They are in the center of the metal ion, and it has these polarities which attract other particles. They call them ligands. They drag them through your body, drop them off. So normally they're going to drop them off and come back. Well, you die. The blood is still out there. It still has all these charges, and it's got all these other things attached to it, but they start to get stripped away. Then these become available in these colors to attach to something that is, it wants to be, that color wants to be attached to it. And in the case of the heart, the, um, these heart strings or ventricle walls or whatever they are, has an affinity to bond to something with this blue. Now, in this area over here, you see, there's a little bit of green. Instead of, the, why is it not all blue? Why is it green here? Well, there was probably some other invasion of another transition metal, because these are all transition metals. Every one of those was these different colors, and they attached. Now, this heart was laying like this. Normally, this would have been flat like that. And the two of them would have been together like this. It's cut open now. This was the top. And I can tell that because the, the, there's no transition metals up here, which are the heavy part. They're going to fall to the bottom, which is down here. Now, at the same time, I think it might have maybe been twisted this way, where this is a little heavier, so it sunk to this side. I don't know. Or there was another organ over here that was issuing some kind of copper into here or whatnot. But I do know that all of these different colors are because of the bonding of the transition metals to the silicates. Just exactly what it said in that article. All right, the, the, this is Boulder Opal is what I just showed you was that heart. And here's what it's made of. They're found in Queensland and I believe also Yoa. Um, in Australia, but anyway, they're slightly different method than other opals, forming inside an iron stone. Well, this iron stone, iron is blood. Iron is, is blood. The concretion was formed due to ionization from sedimentary deposition. No, not correct. By definition, they are ionized concretion of varying hardness with an approximate opal composition of silicon dioxide, 28%, and then iron, which is blood, Fe2O3, is arterial blood. That's the stuff that creates the best opals, plus aluminum, all right? 68% is that. 
and, and, and aluminum dioxides, I mean um, um, silicon uh, feldspar is made of silicon aluminum. Wait a minute, hold on. Let me just be sure I'm right here on this. Yeah, here it is right here. Feldspar is the aluminosilicate mineral containing various amounts of other things, potassium, sodium, calcium. It makes up 60% of Earth's crust. Most common feldspar are in pegamatites. Yeah, what I, what I showed you, that heart, I believe was a yoa nut. It says opals occur as filling or lining between the con concentric layers or in radical or random cracks in ironstone or as a kernel in smaller concretions or nuts. Well, that heart was a nut as found at Yoa and Koroit fields, the famous Yoa nuts. Well, that, when they cut it open, it's a heart. All right, so don't forget, these are the layers I believe that Paul is drilling through right here. And he's seeing the same layers over and over. And then he has to stop before they hit into the, the lung tissue or it explodes. Now, I'm gonna, I got my microscope all set up here and we're gonna be going into some, some uh, really deep stuff with all the pleura and the fascia and the difference between the two and the alveoli. And even I have a lung here from space, an iron lung. They can't get, they can't turn the blood, which is the iron, Fe2O3, into, you know, really iron from the blood until it reaches 2700 degrees. When it did, it exploded all these little holes out through here. I think it's 2700, I forget the exact temperature, but these holes, which were the alveoli, exploded. And I can show this, and I can see there is still what lo looks pretty damn clear look to me is still blood. And the catalase test shows there's still bubbling catalase in there, which is an enzyme created by all living things. It's still in there. And this is iron, so whatever... It, it, it's just not big enough to smelt con completely. Because I can show you iron things that came through space that still have blood in them. As a matter of fact, I'll show you one, just to bolster my claim on this. But this has one of those little latches in the lung, too. I'm going to show you in the microscope, which also shows that it's a lung. It's got one of those latches. Okay, my friends, here goes AI again. This is kind of comical. Now, iron oxide is blood, Fe2O2, Fe2O3, Fe is iron, O is oxygen, iron oxides. Blood is iron oxides. Now, the temperature required to smelt iron oxides, which is blood, into metal iron is around 2300 degrees, 2282. That's almost 300 degrees below iron's melting point of 2,800 degrees. All right, so the smelting of iron in a, of, of the blood in this ball took place at 2,282 degrees, which is almost 300 degrees below the melting point. So it didn't completely melt, it smelt. It. it didn't melt, it smelt it. Now, but in my world, the difference between 2282 and 2800 is 500-ish. They're saying it's almost 300. Uh, AI's got a little ways to go. <laughs> all right, so we all know that the black and the red is the blood. Well, here is an iron meteorite. Well, metal. Let's call them metal. Mostly they smelt into iron because mostly it was iron because this was the blood. And then it all bubbled up and everything because it was hot enough. Now, this must have been over 2,800, 2,900 degrees. The one I'm showing you here still smelted, turned into iron primarily. 
but it's um, it didn't melt into a ball. This did, however, the two artery and the vein are still quite prominent, and they're here. Now let's look at a closer shot. And here's the artery and vein right there. You see that that red spot? <laughs> That's the artery. All right, coming in to feed whatever this was, and I have a feeling this was a liver. And there's the vein, which is the black spot. All these different crystallized patterns and colors are different types of metals that have have given off all the cheap stuff that's below the metal range, and then it all globbed back together as it cooled down and crystallized. That's what happens with these meteorites. Now this one just didn't get hot enough, it wasn't big enough to smelt. I mean to melt. It smelted. And I'm going to put a show, we're going to, the next video is going to be all microscope shots of all of these things that I'm claiming. And we're going to get, actually we're going to fracture a lung and see if I can recreate what's up on the, um, the rover which crushed through a lung. And they claim there's sulfur there. We'll find out. Okay, so I'm hoping Paul will address this. Because this is all geology. There's nothing here I'm showing that isn't geology. He's supposed to be a, a pretty accomplished geologist, PhD. He's been working in the field for many years. He feels very confident. But this is new stuff. And again, this opals, is, is, these are body parts. This is somebody's gigantic eyeball. You see that little strap right there? That's what turns your eyeball. All right, that's an eyeball. Now, every, all opals are bio, biological. They fill in the little holes that are the cellular parts. And th what happens is one of the transition metals takes hold inside of one of these compartments, and then it starts to crystallize and grow. Like this one didn't completely fill the compartment yet. And some of them have a couple of different colors in them, but mostly they start to grow and they fill up and they get really, it depends, like, see, this one here is really puffy, like it's, somehow got started early or something and that when they're um, and opals um, that's how they work that's a nautilus but I have a different take on these ancient ones I think this was an anchor of some sort and you see the real, real green out here and the reddish stuff in the center and then the real dark in the center there why are those different colors there. And when I examined, I have a lot of people send me a lot of stuff on these. These are ammonites. Now they call them um, nautiluses. But these were called ammonites. And they have a certain structure to them that I believe they were anchors for giant, 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 giant creatures. And they were in their body as body anchors. Now they're much, 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 much smaller. All right, so I suppose that's it for today. Um, again, I hope Paul will respond and we can actually get somewhere on this. I, I, I think he's really seriously interested. He's making that step forward and nobody else has. So, I, 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 again, I want to apologize for being a little too, you know, combative. But um, I, I felt, let's just get past that. Let's tomorrow's a new day. Let's try to engage back and forth. Can he address my concerns about his concerns? And I have shown that these layers will be consistent every single time, exactly what he's saying. And if I can see his, his um, specimens that he looks for, I may be able to, you know, understand what he's looking at. And I think it will be something like this as it goes right down through the layers just before they hit the bags of blood. And the blood is where you're going to get all the hydrocarbons. And that's what they want for the best quality of gases and oils. Now, I don't like the idea of drilling and fracking and all that stuff. It is expanding the atmosphere and it's going to destroy the earth. And it is in the process of doing it right now. We're burning way too much. And now with all these fires and everything, that's also a huge source of combustion gases, which is continues to make our atmosphere go way out like this and scrub, scrub harder and harder and harder as we go down through space. 
And that scrub creates an enormous amount of heat out there. It's like 2,700 degrees or more than that out there. That's why these, these um, metal asteroid, uh, metal meteorites melt coming through the layer of space. They're entering in a zone that is nothing but electrons because it's scrubbing its electrons against other electrons, creating a force that is, is one way, basically. All those electrons are coming in. Some will bounce back out, very, very, very few. Most will come in and they'll stay in. And that's what makes plants grow and warms up this climate and all that. But now we're so pumped up that the scrub is so hard that all the turmoil is tearing up our atmosphere, something terrible, huge storms, huge, weather pattern changes, huge lightning and huge amounts of water and, and flooding and hurricanes and tornadoes. It's not good. And it's not going to get better. It's, the bigger it gets, the worse it gets. So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. I think I've shown that my evidence and my research should be looked into. And I hope Paul will respond. That's all I can hope for. All right. I love you all. Thank you. Bye.